Today's episode of the Skull Sessions podcast is brought to you by In Two Minutes or Less, Elite Sports Emergency Care Training. Use the link in the description to learn more about how In Two Minutes or Less can help ensure your medical team is backed by a best practice emergency action plan and life-saving medical skills. Uh, Welcome back, everyone, to this uh, edition of Skull Sessions, Sports Emergency Care podcast produced by Sports Medicine Concepts. Uh, In this session, I want to welcome with us today Kathleen Bashinsky, the Assistant Professor of Public Health at Muhlenberg College. Um, Kathleen, welcome and thank you for joining us today on Skull Sessions. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so I I wanted to start off uh, a little bit with uh, about your role. Uh, And as we had talked about previously, uh, your role as the Assistant Professor of Public Health at Muhlenberg College. So tell us a little bit because it's you know, we, we've had some different guests on the podcast, but I would say this is the first time we've had someone in your role as looking specifically at public health. So tell, tell us a little bit about your role at Muhlenberg College as, uh, as the professor of public health and what you do there. Absolutely. Yeah. So my background is in public health and I studied both epidemiology, which is kind of known as the science of public health. That's when we design studies to try to look at, um, you know, how risky cigarettes are, how they're associated with lung cancer, basically any other kind of public health issue. And I ended up focusing in on injury prevention as the particular kind of public health focus. So as a public health professor at Muhlenberg College, it's a small liberal arts college where we look at public health issues in a broad perspective. So including both the science of of public health, but also cultural and social factors that contribute to public health problems. And I've ended up focusing largely on sports just because there's a huge array of sports injuries that I see as a public health problem affecting uh, you know, thousands or even millions of young athletes. And I also think it's a really interesting topic to look at, not just from a scientific perspective, but also to be studying the social, social attitudes and, and cultural factors that go into how we recognize and treat injury. So of, of all of just in that little intro uh, of all of the things that you could pick you fo- you you decide to focus in on sports injury prevention and uh, so did you have are you an athlete from were you an athlete at one time and what, of all the things you could have picked you you pick athletics and injury prevention uh, how how does that come about yeah I, I would say two reasons and the first one is you're spot on it comes partly from personal experience I was a soccer player and I had what's a very common injury, which is I ripped my ACL. In fact, I had the, the sort of notorious triad of I ripped oh, my ACL, yeah. my ACL, and my meniscus yeah. all at once when I was in high school. And that really influenced my perspective. Um, I went through the surgery, and I had lots of you know friends and, and teammates who also were affected by these kinds of injuries. And I thought, you know, this isn't getting enough attention from a public health point of view. This is a broad scale problem um, that we could be studying more from that population level perspective. Uh, So that's one factor. And I think the second factor that drew me to sports is that unlike many other public health topics like smoking, sports have really wonderful uh, health benefits too. So I thought this was a really neat topic to try to figure out, well, how do we maximize the health benefits, the uh, physical activity and the emotional health and mental health and all the great benefits of sports while trying to minimize the risks. So from my point of view, it was a wonderful topic to study because it's so complex and interesting. So that, that's it, that, that is extremely interesting that you, that you bring this up um, because in the, in the time we've been doing this podcast series, uh, one of the central themes outside of uh, head protection and concussion and those types of things that that we're going to get into here shortly. One of the central themes that always comes across, no matter what guest we have on, no matter what topic um, we we eventually get to, it's always the health benefits versus the risk. So in in the last half a dozen or or, or so guests that we've had on, that is always something that comes up that issue, and the the idea of that there is some sort of a risk involved in 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 this and this is a good segue into our discussion about head protection and there there is a risk of head injury in and it, whether it's football soccer basketball what have you there there is a risk but what is that risk 
and how does it compare to the 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 well measured benefits of team sports uh, of just participating in athletics in in general? So maybe from a public health perspective, you can give us a little bit about that because a lot of the other guests we've had have been able to talk about the risk of concussion and but we've kind of just brushed over the positive. So do you have, what are your thoughts from a public health perspective? Let's forget about the injury side of things and let's talk about the benefit side of things. So what, what are the actual benefits that you see or, or maybe have even been able to measure relative to participating in athletics? Well, I think we absolutely see just physical activity as a whole, whether it's you know, through a formal athletic program or even just you know going for a run or for a walk on your own, just anything that gets you out and moving is incredibly well documented to have both um, long-term health benefits in terms of the physical aspect of you know cardiovascular health, um, but also in terms of the mental health aspect in terms of alleviating stress. Um, it has really well documented benefits. Where I think it gets interesting with sports is that the way that ledger looks in terms of the risks and benefits will look quite different depending on the sport. So if we're thinking about the risk and benefits of swimming, for example, both the injury profile and the kind of cardiovascular output and, and so forth will look very different in a sport like swimming as compared to tackle football, as compared to volleyball, and so on and so forth. So what I would love to see more of, I don't think we have as much research as I would like to see that's sort of sport specific. I think we have general research on the benefits of physical activity, and we certainly have lots of research looking at the risks of brain injury or knee injury or all these other kinds of risks. But what I would love to see is sort of more tailored research on here's what the risk benefit profile looks like of individual sports. Um, I think one resource or one place I've seen where they've started to try to do this, uh, the Aspen Sport Institute, I don't know if you've come across them, uh, but they, they created a uh, very preliminary measure of high school sports sort of risks and benefits, and they looked at both um, the physical aspect, what are the sort of physical injuries, as well as the um, amount of actual exercise that you're getting, and certainly something like soccer, where you're running almost the entire mm -hmm. time, um, has sort of a higher cardiovascular output in various ways than other sports, um, but then also looking at the mental health um, aspect, and are these particular sports at the high school level documented to sort of have good mental and emotional benefits. So I think we've started to move in that direction. What was the name of this group again? Because I, I believe I've heard of it, but let's let let's see if we can't get a reference up for that so that we have Absolutely. a place for people to go. And that was Aspen? Yeah, it's called the Aspen, uh, A-S-P-E-N Sports Institute. And um, they, they have a measure, and I'll, I would have to look up the exact name of it, um, to, to, to be able to give you the name after, but they published a sort of profile of high school sports, and I can just do a quick look up and see if I can get the exact name of this. Um, but they, oh, it's called the Healthy Sport Index, and that's their tool. Um, they developed this in partnership with the Hospital for Special Surgery to look at 10 of the most popular high school sports for boys and girls and just look at how can we think about the safety aspects of these sports, the physical activity of each of these sports, and then the psychosocial benefits. Um, so it's just a really interesting tool, and I'd love to see more research yeah. going in that direction to look at these sports more holistically. I, I yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent with that because you know we we talk about the risk and and when individuals, parents, uh, or the individual athletes are making a decision about what sport they want to play, what if they want to participate in a particular sport, that's a very individual type of risk analysis that you have to go through. Yeah. And, and oftentimes the information isn't there to make a really good decision. Uh, and that's kind of what, you know, that that's somewhat of a segue uh, into what our, our topic is going to be on, on the pseudosciences. And, um, but I, I want to, as we introduce that topic of, of pseudoscience relative to risk, if you will, uh, and making that individual decision, I want to just let everybody know a little bit about how we connected. Um, yeah. And and basically, 
our producer Morgan uh, came across an article. I'm not exactly sure how how you came across that. It, it actually it came up as a notification on my phone. It came up through Apple, right? Through yeah. a so so my producer who has basically nothing to do with sports medicine except that he works here producing our stuff and and uh, actually can probably do a lot of the emergency response stuff really well just because he's been around it so much. But anyway, uh, that aside, he just happened to get an alert. Uh, on his phone uh, uh, from, I guess, Wired, which is a Morgan, a fairly popular yeah. internet news magazine kind of place, right? So he gets this thing on Wired. He sends it over to me. I read that, found your name in that, looked up the actual article that you wrote that was referenced in this Wired um, online magazine, uh, which was actually published in The Lancet. And then, and then you and I connected a little bit, talked on the phone, and you know, a couple of months later, we're, we're able to schedule to have you on. So, uh, I interesting how those how those things come about, and and how perfectly it plays into our recent kind of trend and topic coverage, which looks at the current state of football head protection and. I don't mean to suggest that it's, you know, head protection is only an issue in football. I don't mean to suggest that, but it does tend to circulate back around to football all the time. Um, but as we were talking about risk and benefit and how that risk is a very individual decision that has to be made, right? A lot of that decision making process is based on what we like to think is science. Uh, but if we look at some of these claims by manufacturers, if we look at some of these products, if we look at some of the information, uh, forget about products, let's just look at information. If we just look at some of the information and the sources of information that the general public has at their disposal, uh, you reference that as pseudoscience. So, so what, do you, what is it exactly do you mean by pseudoscience? So when, when I'm using the term pseudoscience, um, I'm referring to references or, or, or material that sometimes can be in appearance or looks like it might appear to be based on the scientific method, but in actuality is not based on rigorous research or on accurate knowledge of human anatomy or otherwise based on uh, a body of evidence that other scientists would be able to replicate or would otherwise be considered credible. Um, and so unfortunately, uh, from my perspective, we're really plagued by this right now uh, in sports, maybe more generally, but particularly when it comes to concussions. I sort of see this as maybe the, the dark underbelly of the increased awareness of concussions. It's been a wonderful thing to have so many more people now know, you know, a concussion is a real injury. This is not something you can just walk off. You should seek medical attention. So overall, the increased awareness has been wonderful. But the, the dark lining to this is that there are a handful of either businesses or not very reputable researchers or, or other kinds of people who are taking advantage of this public concern to promote products that are not actually based uh, in rigorous scientific research. And they make claims for them that might sound kind of science-based. So I think the, the term pseudoscience kind of gets at, even if it sounds like it might have a basis in science, when you sort of look behind the curtain, so to speak, you realize that this is not repli replicable or authoritative. So from a parent's perspective, from a general population perspective, how does one determine whether a claim is based in pseudoscience or has a, you know, that, that foundation in pseudoscience relative to actual rigorous scientific, uh, as we might call evidence-based, uh, information. So, so what are what are the things that the general population look for to indicate mm, shady claim or uh, actually a, a you know this is something that I do want to seriously consider in my risk benefit analysis of whether to continue on or to suggest that my son or daughter participate. What, what are some a, things we look for? That's a great question. I think it's really challenging from a parent's point of view. It's definitely hard to evaluate some of this. But I think some of the things to look for uh, would just be start off with, if it sounds quick and easy or too good to be true, it probably is. So just to bear in mind, brain injuries are very complicated injuries, and there's not one single quick fix. So if there's anything that's like a supplement or a pill or just sort of an easy-sounding solution to 
treat a brain injury or concussion, I would definitely look at that with a skeptical eye. Um, another thing to look for is, has this product been evaluated by independent researchers? So unfortunately, sometimes these products will make claims and it'll say something like, you know, this prevents 30% of concussions or some other claim of that nature. And if you follow the little asterisk, you'll realize this is either based on in-house research or otherwise is com coming from the company itself. And there's no evidence that any independent group of researchers has actually evaluated this and found data supporting that claim. So if something makes a claim that I can just drink this uh, and my my brain and my brain is then protected, uh, that is a little silly, right? And, and in fact, right. that is uh, right. You can you can just drink this ergogenic aid or this supplement and you'll be a certain percent stronger tomorrow. Right. Or some ridiculous claims like that. So tell me a little bit, because we, we talked a little bit off off the air about some of these manufacturers that particularly uh, get your air up a little bit, right? I mean, I mean, you you would mention there are a couple in particular that really aggravate you when you when you think about those. So so tell me a little bit about some of these uh, organizations, or some of these manufacturers, and some of these claims um, that that really get your air up a little bit. Um, so you're spot on that the drinks really get under my skin because there's just no plausible physiological basis that any kind of beverage could either heal or prevent or otherwise sort of address uh, a brain injury. And two in particular that I think are particularly egregious, uh, one is called brain armor. And this is something that's described as a liquid supplement the claim is that it's got omega-3 fatty acids in there, and omega-3 fatty acids are good for your brain, and therefore somehow this will provide quote-unquote armor to protect your brain, even if you're participating in a high-impact sport uh, such as football. And in fact, uh, Brain Armor ended up developing an official partnership with Pop Warner uh, Youth Football and is advertised in the pages of uh, Pop Warner magazine, which are, you know, ads aimed essentially at either young football players or their parents. So I think this is a particularly egregious example of even though you and I might say, oh, that sounds very silly on its face, of course a drink can't prevent a concussion. If you have something like this advertised in a formal sort of official magazine targeted at parents of young athletes, it's absolutely something that a parent might look at and think, oh, I should give this a try. Maybe it'll help address concussions. Uh, the other example that uh, comes to my mind from a couple years ago, I believe this was 2016, uh, was a chocolate milk that also was claimed to either sort of help heal you faster or otherwise minimize the symptoms of a concussion. And this company uh, actually teamed up with high schools in Maryland and gave the high school students the drink without telling the high school students that they were part of a research study. So it was very unethical in multiple ways. The study did not go through formal approval from the Institutional Review Board to check that everyone was giving informed consent. Um, the study was not done in a rigorous way and the study was never published in a reputable journal. So there were several um, superintendents of school districts that actually were considering buying this chocolate milk to give to their athletes, even though there was very little evidence for it. And I think that stemmed from a desire to try to do something. The superintendents were understandably concerned about injuries. They wanted to help protect their athletes. And they saw you know, information about this drink and basically thought, hmm, what's the harm in this? Why don't we spend yeah. some money? Okay. Uh, and so you actually have evidence of people giving kids these drinks um, or thinking about giving kids these drinks on the, the misguided idea that they might help prevent concussions. Okay, so I, I have two things that, that I want to bring up from, from that conversation, from, from those comments. First thing, you, you mentioned the superintendents, they, they want to do something, right? Uh, and, and rightfully so, they should, and that, that's a good thing. They, they, they see a problem, they want to address that problem. It's a safety concern for them. They want their athletes to be safe. So that, that's a good thing. Let's, let's give them credit for that, okay? Um, but you also mentioned if it doesn't hurt, 
uh, it maybe it doesn't do uh, maybe it doesn't do any good, but it doesn't do any harm anyway. So why not? Why not give it a try? So what what is the harm uh, if if the chocolate milk claims are um, false as, as as they relate to brain protection? Okay, and if if brain armors drink, their claims are baseless or you know relatively baseless, but they don't do any harm. Uh, why not? Why not do it? Yeah, that's a great question. And to me, the biggest reason why not is that it's likely to give athletes a false sense of security that may end up either leading them to participate in more dangerous ways, thinking, you know, now my brain is safe, so I don't have to worry about this. Or it might even lead to them not actually seeking proper medical attention yeah. should they sustain an injury. So my big concern especially with kids or, you know, young adults, teenagers who may be playing, is they might think, oh, I got this chocolate milk, you know, I'm, I'm experiencing a little dizziness or nausea or other symptoms of a possible concussion. I'm just going to drink this chocolate milk mm. and that they might do that instead of notifying their athletic trainer, right. letting their coach know and seeking help. So my big concern is that this would be a false sense of security that actually gets in the way of proper medical attention. Right, and that was a point I think you brought up in the article, was the danger of those claims redirecting us a little bit away, um, making it, like as you say, um, I, I got hit pretty hard, I'm feeling a little dizzy, but I'm just gonna go over to the sideline and drink some of my brain armor, uh, and then back in I go, right? Uh, exactly. So yeah, I, I think that's a really important point that you make in the article. Uh, it's also a really important point, I think, that uh, those uh, are sports healthcare professionals or, or healthcare professionals or uh, those in the know. We have this problem that we have to combat this pseudoscience somehow. Um, and that's a good point to make is that, you know, be careful of these claims because it can be harmful because it draws us away from what is actually going to protect you uh, or is going to make sure that you recover properly and get the right care. So I think that's a really important point that you make in the article and, and one that I think healthcare professionals should be particularly cognizant of because that is a way, at least one avenue for us to combat the pseudoscience is to address it head on and say, you know, these things draw us away from what we know relatively, as far as I'm concerned, we know relatively nothing about concussion and about the brain. And I think anybody that knows a little bit about the brain realizes what we know doesn't even scratch the surface of, of, of the complexity of it, right? So what we do know uh, kind of gets covered up or, or get, we get drawn away from what we do know by some of these dubious claims. So I think that's an important point for healthcare professionals to understand. But let me play the devil's advocate for a minute on, on these two things. Let's look at chocolate milk because chocolate milk is a miracle cure for everything, right? It improves its per it it's improves sports performance. It, it it's a great recovery drink. It's all these things. It's a miracle. Chocolate milk. Um, so let's look at chocolate milk for a minute. You could say that chocolate milk actually might be beneficial to someone who's received a concussion because it is providing a glucose or or a sugar uh, source that the brain can then uh, help digest and provide energy for. To, to, for recovery during this energy crisis that it's going through after the result of head trauma. So we have this neurometabolic cascade and built into that neurometabolic cascade after trauma is this well-documented energy crisis. Uh, and some science has suggested that if we give carbohydrate supplementations during this early phase of this energy crisis, it can help, uh, it can help that recovery process. The same goes true. The same can, argument can be made with the omega threes. I didn't realize when we talked earlier that part of Brain Armor's claims were that they were providing omega threes. Now you can go to the you can go to very rigorous scientific journals and find studies that show or that suggest that omega threes have a protective role uh, in the myelin sheath of, of the brain, in particular with with injury and with trauma. So we can go to the literature and find a basis for this omega-3 and a basis for the sugar that's, that's going to be provided by the chocolate milk. But it, it, it's, 
I have my own take on why that that doesn't work. What's what's your take? Why doesn't that work for you? And, I think, and, and for me, I think that's actually a wonderful illustration of something that's really common in pseudoscience, which is there might be a small kernel of truth in there, or there's sometimes there might be studies that are slightly related, but really about something else. So it's absolutely true that there's some research pertaining to omega-3s and, and sort of sugar and different kinds of contexts where you might say, okay, omega-3 might be part of, for example, what's often known as the Mediterranean diet, and this has been studied in various kinds of nutrition studies and seems to be associated with various long-term health benefits. So there certainly is certain kinds of research on these particular um, components of, of, a, of the beverage, but then that research is taken and applied in a different context where we really don't have any evidence. So even if we might have some evidence in a different context that omega-3 could be part of a balanced diet or have this other kind of benefit, we have zero evidence that it actually plays a role in like somehow healing the brain after a brain injury. This has never been studied in humans with concussion, ever. There just is no research that's rigorous of studying this in humans with concussion. And I don't think it would even necessarily be worth doing that research, um, because from my perspective, given what we know about the risks of brain injury, given what we know about physiology um, and all the other background information we have, from a public health point of view, there is so much greater benefit in saying, how do we actually prevent these injuries? And how do we engage with neurologists after these injuries happen? That's where we're gonna have the biggest benefit in pr protecting people spending a bunch of money on saying, does this omega-3 have any like tiny little benefit after a brain injury? That's not where we're gonna get the most bang for our buck. So to me, it's it's mainly a distraction, but it's a distraction that might work when in, in advertising or in sort of convincing consumers to take a look because it might have that small, as you point out, sort of kernel, kernel of, of truth, truth. Yeah. that then kind of gets warped. But, you, you know, and, and I don't know anything about this brain armor stuff. I, I, I never saw it, never looked at it. Uh, but if it does have omega-3s in it, it can make that claim. Uh, and, and you could have some basis in that claim if you wanted to stretch it. But I also know that the amount of omega-3s that you have to take is probably going to be pretty hard by drinking... Uh, brain armor I, I would imagine because I, I know the dosages of omega-3s require an omega-3 supplement and to think you know it's probably it would have to be a bottle of omega-3s right. is, is what brain armor would have to be before we would reach those levels that have been found to be beneficial uh, right. in, in in scientific research so again I, I, I really like your comment about it's a distraction away from what is really important. And your comment here today about if an athlete gets, is, is under the perception that they can take these supplements, uh, wear this mouth guard. The mouth guard was, was the other one that we had talked about. Um, or wear this particular football helmet. Um, and if they get a little bit dizzy, they don't have to necessarily tell somebody about it because now they can just go to the sideline and take this supplement. Um, and and that's, I think that's just such a valid point that you make that you know it's it's worth repeating a couple of times here to, to let the general population know and to let sports health sports healthcare professionals know this is the kind of information that you have to be providing to moms and dads and coaches and parents if you see somebody drinking brain armor. We see this all the time with every with things that aren't even related to our topic. You go into the locker room, any given locker room, and you're going to see empty ibuprofen bottles on the floor, and you're you're going to see whey protein supplement bottles on the floor, and and all those types of things. And it's just it's an opportunity for you as a sports healthcare professional to to address the team and say, look, understand you're taking these. The reality is. I'm not going to stop you from doing this. You know, we're not going to stop athletes from taking creatine, probably. We're not going to stop them. If they've been drinking brain armor, we're probably not going to stop them from, from doing that. But at least we can say, look, um, understand, but realize if you do get hurt, 
these are the really important things that you need to do. This is not going to protect you like we are going to protect you with the right course of treatment and the right care. I think that's just such an important, uh, if, if nothing else comes out of our conversation today, it's to bring that across to the people that are listening, uh, that are hopefully listening, right? <laughs> Um, so, so great. That, that's uh, some really good stuff that I wanted to get out of our, our, our talking points. Um, so we, we talk about pseudoscience and we talk about more rigorous science. What are, what are the, what, what makes up real science? What, what are what are the if we talk about evidence based that's that's the big catchphrase right now right over the last decade or so everything is turned its attention towards evidence based practice so what are what are what makes up evidence based information that we can then discuss this information on that's a great question so the the way evidence can look ranges from individual case case studies and clinical experience to observational studies, which might be following athletes over time and observing what happens, to um, what's considered sometimes the gold standard, which is a randomized control trial. Um, but whichever kind of study design that's used, I would say there's a couple hallmarks of evidence base across all kinds of study design, which is that the researchers have transparently described exactly what their methods are, exactly how they obtain their results. Um, that they have shared that design of their study with their peers who have reviewed it. And then ideally what happens is that this gets published in a peer-reviewed journal where other scientists have taken a look, um, have said, yes, this meets the standard of an appropriate study design, um, and we will share this and publish this. And now other scientists can read what was done, and if they so choose, they can try to replicate what was done and see if what they find is consistent. So I guess the, the main hallmarks are transparency um, and sharing with colleagues. And there's no sort of single study that's perfect or is going to give us all the information we need. The nature of science is that it sort of slowly builds on previous research. Um, and that is distinct from pseudoscience in several ways. Pseudoscience, we often don't know all the details, or there might be a little fact here or there, but we don't know the full design. There may not have even been a rigorously designed study, um, and we are not able to replicate or see, you know, is this really based on, on true data or true evidence? Uh, you bring up a good point, and that is that sound information, science evolves over time, right? So if you find a study that makes a pretty outstanding claim that's probably a study that is it is somewhere far out in a continuum of of research that's been done over a long period of time right so yeah. it if you find a, a study that really provides some sort of really significant outcome you it's that reference list at the end of that is probably pretty significant and probably has some really good researchers, well-known, maybe even famous researchers behind it that have been doing that line of research for a long period of time. So that's, a, that's, that's another important, I think, point to make just for the general population. If, if you can't go to the literature and find a bunch of other similar research findings, you're probably not looking at a rigorous outcome or you're looking at a groundbreaking investigation that is gonna start a whole new line uh, right. of, of research. So th that's, that's an important point that you make. Um, we, we had talked about this idea of science, rigorous science, evidence-based science, uh, and we talked a little bit about the tiers of journals. And you made, uh, you made a claim, I think, or you made a statement in your article that said sometimes the sports medicine industry isn't associated with the greatest scientific research i might take issue with that and and i uh because you know there are a lot of good scientific journals that i could name that would be tier one journals that produce a lot of good science so there, there must be something else behind that so what is it what was behind that statement that would that would allow you to make that statement yeah so behind that statement i think it's a, a great point there absolutely is 
really, you know, reputable research out there being done and absolutely in that very careful way of slowly building off of previous scientific evidence. So that's out there, but behind the claim um, that my, my colleague James Smolikan and I were making in that article is that unfortunately there's also um, in some cases, as you point out, sort of lower tier journals or journals that don't have quite as much oversight where sometimes the people that are reviewing the studies are actually in some ways affiliated with the studies or affiliated with the industry and there isn't actually always that careful independent oversight that we normally would expect from a reputable peer-reviewed journal. So there are sometimes, for example, people sitting on the editorial board of the journal who maybe also have a stake in a particular company or maybe they sit on the board of medical directors of a company such as Brain Armor or some other company promoting a product. And so sometimes studies can kind of get out into the literature that haven't been fully vetted in the way we would normally expect. Um, and I think this is particularly a problem that might afflict more specialized journals. Um, so the sort of bigger, I'm sure some of these names will be familiar to listeners, something like a New England Journal of Medicine or the Journal of the American Medical Association or the Lancet, they have a, a great diversity of scientists and researchers who are involved in those journals. And so they'll have lots of different kinds of people looking at the articles and they can normally catch if there's something that's a little bit off. But if you have a much smaller or more specialized journal, sometimes it's a very small world where it's sort of the same people always yeah. reviewing the same yeah, studies. Yeah, that's, that's um, certainly that true, yeah. You kind of sometimes lose out a little bit on that fresh set of eyes or independent perspective that's more likely to catch something. And I, I think, to your point, maybe sports medicine, athletics, competition, maybe we're a little more susceptible to that because the desire to be bigger, stronger, faster, right? Um, so maybe maybe we buy into things a little bit faster. I, I don't, that, that's anecdotal observation. That, that's just me off the cuff. I don't have any basis for that. But you could certainly see how, you know, a desire for an athlete to be bigger, stronger, faster is going to make them uh, more aware of those claims and maybe – you know, maybe think, well, if I drink this or if I do this, what's the harm? And if I if if it's right and I'm bigger, stronger, faster, I'm, maybe I'm willing to overlook some of that. Right. Yeah. I think it's a really good point. I think something that in some ways distinguishes sports medicine or, or sports focus is that it's not just about protecting athletes. There's also this motive to enhance the athletic performance. And there's sort of sort of multiple priorities that are kind of operating. And then sometimes, as you point out, the priority is much more focused on enhancing performance or getting a ba an athlete back to the playing field as quickly as possible. Um, if that's where the focus is, there might not be quite as much oversight or care in terms of, well, what's the long-term health implication or does mm. this really work in terms of prioritizing health and safety? My, my uh, a, a comment that I make to athletes probably on a daily basis is we – as medical, as sports healthcare professionals, we cannot speed the healing process up. We, uh, your body heals at a particular rate. We can't speed that. None of these fancy treatment modalities, no, no fancy rehab protocols, no fancy drinks or pills or surgeries are going to speed your body's healing. You, there, there. We can do things to mess it up. You know, we can slow the process down. But if something, if we know that something takes nine to 12 months to recover from, don't let anybody tell you that I have the secret that is going to get you back in six months instead of nine months. It just, it, it, it's, it's not something you should be relying on. We can't make you bigger, stronger, faster, uh, any faster than your body wants it. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I, I completely agree. And yeah. I think there's understandable tendency just psychologically, we might be thinking, you know, you are such an amazing athlete. Maybe you do heal faster. Or there's just this sort of tendency, I think, this sort of bias where people want to believe, oh, he's a great athlete or she's a great athlete. She'll be back in no time. But you're not superhuman. Even right. if you're a great athlete, you're still human. And as you point out, there's just basic, basic healing processes or right. basic principles of physiology that apply across the board, 
whether you're Michael Phelps or an average swimmer, you're still a human being. Right. Yeah. And that's that's hard for athletes to grasp. Athletes grasp, you know, they think, well, I'll go into the work. I'll go into the weight room. I'll work harder. I'll eat better. I'll take these supplements and I will get better. I'll get bigger, stronger, faster and recover faster than what they're telling me. Now, again, you can set up an environment where you allow the body to heal at its most optimal pace. And that's what you get with those types of individuals. But you can't speed the healing process up beyond what you are physiologically set up to do. And that, um, but, you know, the, the point can be made. Let's, let's go back to some of these dubious claims. Um, the point is often made, we can do that for you. All you have to do is take the supplement. All you have to do is this particular treatment protocol. Oh, and here, by the way, is this world famous athlete that we've paid to tell you that this happens. So that's a problem in, in particular in pseudoscience as well. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think we have a number of sort of celebrity endorsements or famous athletes where if you are a role model for millions of kids, if you're lending your voice to a pseudoscientific product, it really increases the risk that you know, high school students are gonna run out and say, well, I've gotta get that supplement or I've gotta get that quick fix because my sports hero is saying that that's how he or she got to be the star that they are, how they got back out to the field. Um, I think another example that makes me think of, of another one of those products that kind of gets under my skin is something called a concussion collar. Um, I don't know if you've come across these or not, um, but it's a collar that claims that if you wear it around your neck, it can basically you're lightly compressing your jugular vein it will create a quote-unquote cushion for the brain and unfortunately several nfl players have actually worn this um and it's the kind of thing that just really worries me if i think there's you know kids that are going to be looking and seeing somebody wear this concussion collar maybe they'll start to think it can help heal or prevent their concussion and it has no basis in now i'm physiology i will I'm a science guy. I like, I like science. I, I like things that are grounded in science. Um, and if there's something that on face value doesn't make sense to me, but uh, there is scientific basis that, that warrants at least me considering that. All right, so that, that's, that's the way you grow knowledge base-wise, right? I mean, if you stay within your general framework and you never allow for change, you would never allow for things to develop, and you never allow for knowledge to grow, then you stay stagnant. You don't, you, you're, you're not going to stay current with new trends that are valid trends, right? So I, I like to think of myself as being open to pretty much everything. Um, now, when I get into the science and I start to see some of the things that we're talking about, it's like, all right, you know, pretty quick, you can see where we're going, what road we're going down. But there are some things that fundamentally don't make sense. And to starve the brain of blood by putting a collar around your neck, I'm not sure I, I'm not sure who sat around thinking this might work. Let's study this. And then it if you pulled me in and said, Hey, we need some subjects, we're gonna run this random controlled stop uh, thing, and we want you to be in in a group and we're going to choke the blood off to your brain and see what happens. I'd probably be like, you know, I'm not going to participate in that. Um, so I, yeah, that, that's one of the products. I, I will agree with you on that. Uh, but that's one that even there, they have these, the dubious claims and the really fascinating one about that one is they claim. And again, just to be clear, this is completely inaccurate, but they claim it's based on woodpecker brains. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that. <laughs> have some particular physiology and that humans can mimic that basically by putting a collar around their neck. Um, it's completely not true, but there's that sort of kernel that I think some people might think, oh yeah, a woodpecker can hit its head over and over. Here's a product that says it's based on a woodpecker brain. Let me give that a try. At least that's my most generous effort at understanding uh, well, where um, that's coming from. You know, because woodpeckers and humans are so genetically tied that, that yeah, that, that claim, yeah. Now, if it but was, I, just, I will just remind <laughs> listeners: human brains and woodpecker brains, fortunately, are very different from each other. Yeah, that and that was <laughs> a lot bigger, and they have to last a lot longer. Yeah, so there's a lot of differences. That was what we call sarcasm. Yeah, <laughs> just want to. Yeah, let's point that. Let's make sure we make that 
right yeah. here that that is that is sarcasm. Yeah. Correct. All right. So, <laughs> um, so let, let's kind of wrap this up a little bit um, because w with some of the information that you presented in your article that was in the Lancet, and and I will say that. Um, the article that I, uh, the online um, magazine Wired that I read um, was was a legitimate review of what you talked about. But I, I would suggest that listeners, and we'll, we'll provide this link, we'll provide a link to your article that was published in The Lancet. Um, the Wired article does do a good job about kind of highlighting what your, what, what your main points were. Uh, but I think your article is well written in The Lancet and, and well worth uh, a review for that and, and listeners can find that reference link uh, in, in the podcast as well so I, I would suggest that you that you do read that um, and I believe you provided me with some information as well some some other references that kind of look at some of this dubious these dubious claims in advertising we'll make those available as well so um, but as you and I were talking earlier uh, about your article in the Lancet, you you mentioned that you were surprised that uh, it got some attention. Yeah, I was. I mean, I'm I'm a researcher who's very used to. I'll publish something in a journal, and maybe three or four of my colleagues might read it, and I'll have a conversation with them. Um, but I think what ended up happening was the journalist who wrote the Wired article. She reached out to my co-author and me and said, you know, I actually want to write an article about this that's more tailored for the, the general public. Um, and she not only interviewed us, but she interviewed other researchers on a very similar theme because there is this broader trend of pseudoscience. And I was really pleased to see this spark numerous conversations because I think, as you mentioned, sort of across the board, we're sort of an ally but different fields. But I think athletic trainers, physicians, public health researchers, um, all kinds of different health professionals who are looking at sports safety from various angles, we're all increasingly seeing these kinds of products on the market. We're talking to patients who might be um, thinking, oh, can I give this product a try? We really are seeing this trend. So I was really pleased to see this get some attention and to hopefully try to get more accurate information out for people um, because we don't want the only voices in the public square to be the misleading claims or the, the companies with the um, celebrity endorsement or the big platform to put out misleading information, we also want to make sure that the more accurate health and medical information is getting out there as well. So, so I'm going to hit you with a million dollar question then. How do we combat the pseudoscience? How, what, what, what does a physician say in his office? What does the athletic trainer say in the training room to athletes and parents? What is it that we can say uh, when when an, an athlete or a parent brings into the office this uh, nice glossy magazine cover that says we can reduce concussions by thirty eight percent or or whatever whatever claim? How do we combat that in the office with sound information that is actually going to be uh, persuasive? Because those articles that you're talking about are extremely persuasive, and now you're sitting in front of a white coat in an office or in a training room, and, and, and you're trying to combat that. How, how are we supposed to combat a high-profile athlete who says, I made it this far because I take this supplement, or I do this, or I recovered from my concussion in three days, not the standard 7 to 10, because I took this. How are we supposed to possibly combat that? We're supposed to say, oh, well, that's not based in science, and I'm the one that knows here. I'm going to tell you this really boring information. Uh, so how do we combat that? What do, what do we tell people in that, in that environment, in that venue? I think that's a great question. I do think we're at a huge disadvantage, as you yeah. say. I mean, the, the sort of boring, there is no quick fix. That message is inherently at a disadvantage as compared to the Agreed. much more appealing message. But I think in addition to obviously, as you say, just providing the factual information, I think it would be helpful to have more former athletes, be they celebrities or not, be more upfront about, you know, this took me nine or 12 months or what have you to heal from, or, you know, this injury is real. This is how you have to address it. And I think we are starting to see that. I'm really inspired by lots of former be it football players, hockey players, 
soccer players who are now advocates for treating brain injury, who are vocal about their symptoms, who are honest about either the mental health issue or physical health issue that they're going through. And I think having more of those voices be conveying, like, these injuries are real, they're not easy to recover from, here's the kind of medical attention you should be seeking out. I sort of think we need those stories in addition to the data. At least my perspective is, you know, scientists, we love the data, but they're in the, by itself, the data is not enough to sort of tell the story to the public. We also need the stories of the athletes who sort of experience these injuries and are letting younger, you know, especially children and, and other younger amateur athletes know, you know, this is what it's going to take. Um, and it's not going to be uh, a brain armor drink yeah. or a magical collar. This is what you need to do. So we, we can circle this all the way back around then to a public health issue, mm. but not in the traditional sense. It, it, it could very well be a public health issue, not from a head protection standpoint, but a public health issue from an information dissemination standpoint, because think about it. Let, let's talk about, or let's highlight a couple of things that we've, we've mentioned. You've mentioned high profile athletes. High profile athletes don't endorse a product for free. Right. So there's two there's two components to that. They're either being paid very well by the company that wants them to endorse that product or there's an inherent conflict of interest because they are part of the company that is selling that. So one way or the other, they're getting a payday for making that commercial. Right. So now me, you and I, you and I want to conspire together to combat this. Right. And we're going to take out an article or we're going to take out a, a page in that youth football magazine right on the other side of the of the brain armor right we're gonna who's paying for that so yeah. so where does the money come from to combat the conflict of interest in the high profile uh athlete where is where is that coming from well, again we're way behind the eight ball as far as being able to have an impact we are so far behind and i think in my ideal world they obviously don't have enough money or enough that i would like to see them have but ideally it would be coming from a public health point of view, from something like the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, or the NIH, or other health agencies, um, in thinking about this as a public health issue, so that we always, as public health people, are always comparing things to smoking, because big tobacco is a, another mm. sort of very powerful, you know, very financially um, well, you know, wealthy interest that public health had to combat, and the way public health approached that was partly commercials, you know public funding of camp educational campaigns to say cigarettes really do cause long-term harm. We also have to implement regulation, yeah. and I would love to see more regulation. One example I did provide, fortunately, the Federal uh, Trade Commission has limited certain mouth guard companies from making certain claims, so we do have at least some regulation to say if you're providing blatantly inaccurate claims about preventing concussion, you need to stop making those claims or maybe even take that product off the shelves. So I would love to see stronger regulation of what kinds of claims these companies are making, maybe stronger regulation of what's allowed to be marketed to children. Um, maybe you shouldn't be allowed to market this kind of product in the pages of a youth sports yeah, magazine. Right. So I think in thinking about this as a public health issue and maybe using the analogy to smoking, you sort of need a multi-pronged approach and you need that funding from federal health agencies to support getting the message out, getting the education out, and also um, implementing some protections for consumers. So you, you mentioned uh, cigarettes, and, and one of the things on cigarettes is, is a huge warning, right? I mean, they all have to have a, you can't miss the warning label on a pack of cigarettes anymore. It's, it's, it's not really small uh, <laughs> words hidden down below somewhere, whereas a lot of these manufacturers uh, of ergogenic aids and supplements they, they do have some FDA uh, regulations that say you have to have a little asterisk that says this, you know, these claims are not, uh, are not reviewed by the FDA, have not been reviewed by the FDA. So that kind of gives a little indication that maybe we're dealing with something that is based in pseudoscience, right? right. So, so that might be another thing parents and coaches and athletes should look for. If you see that little asterisk that this claim has not been verified by the FDA, that's probably a pretty good indication of where you're standing in the scientific realm. Yeah. Um, maybe, so we'd maybe, love to see it in bigger print. Yeah, that's, yeah, saying, that's where I was going with that. Print. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly where I was going with that. Yeah, maybe that should be as big as it is on, a, on a, the side of a pack of cigarettes, right? 
Correct. I would yeah. love to see that. Yeah. Well, fantastic. I, I, Kathleen, um, I'm, I'm really glad that we did have an opportunity to connect. I think this really wraps up this idea of uh, head protection, in particular some of the, uh, again, I had mentioned that head protection was kind of the general topic, um, but what really came out of the discussion about head protection was health benefits versus risk and, and how do we, where is the information coming from to help us make those, uh, those decisions. And the other uh, important aspect that came out of, of all of these discussions, I think no matter who we talk to, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm gonna put you in this camp too, and, and you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But the other thing that came out of this was more importantly than any kind of technology, medical understanding of treatment, uh, those types of things, more importantly than any of that was changing perceptions, changing mm -hmm. behaviors. Changing athlete behaviors was probably, at the end of the day, likely to have the biggest impact. All right, so we had a guest on not so, not so long ago who talked about heads-up tackling techniques as a way of changing athlete behaviors, right? So we could actually throw our discussion into that realm too, and I'm gonna throw you in there and then let you correct me if I'm wrong. But if we could, in, in essence, change our behavior in terms of where we get our information from and what we allow us to influence our decision about risk versus benefits. That also is changing behavior, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, and I think the one sort of addendum I would, I, or addition I would yeah. add on to that is in order to change behavior, um, to not only put the burden on athletes um, who are trying to navigate this really complicated landscape, especially, you know, children aren't able to look at a product and say, is this right or not? So to also be sure that we have structures in place to facilitate healthier behaviors so that we have structures in place so that athletes can figure out where the most accurate information is and that they're not in a position where their only source of information yeah. is a company making a misleading claim. So to make sure that we're sort of, be it, you know, education campaigns or financial support or whatever else, to make sure that we're building support for athletes to help them make the healthiest choice. Oh, agreed. I, well put. And I think that's a that's a great way to wrap up our discussion on this, except to let uh, those people that are going to be watching the podcast, the, watching the video segment, I, I think we all need to know what your cat's name is. Oh, yes. So that is Gigi, <laughs> and I'm sorry she's been very chatty today, very neglected. <laughs> I apologize. She's, we, I've seen her walk up and down the steps a couple yeah. of times, look out after what's going on. I've heard the meows in the background, so I, I think it's only fair. Because the, those that are watching the video will see the cat go up and down your steps. Those that are listening to the podcast will hear the meows in the background. So it's only fair that we call out your cat and provide everybody. <laughs> Thanks for indulging this special guest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she has lots of opinions about uh, pseudoscience and concussions. Uh, I see that. That's fantastic. Good stuff. But, <laughs> Kathleen, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us on Skull Sessions. I, I appreciate your time and your expertise and um, the information that you've led to this overall discussion. I appreciate that very much and the work that you do. I, I say, can, I say uh, carry on. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate you um, taking the opportunity for the conversation and just having this conversation uh, about sports safety. Wonderful. I'll look forward to, to continuing to, to reach out to you and, and more discussions on this. So thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day. Fantastic. Thank you.